And now for today's program. Rabbi Dr. Daniil Hartman is president of the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem and holds the Kaufman Family Chair in Jewish Philosophy. He is the founder of some of the most extensive education, training, and enrichment programs for scholars, educators, rabbis, and religious and lay leaders in Israel and North America. Rabbi Hartman is a prominent essayist, blogger, and lecturer on issues of Israeli politics, policy, Judaism, and the Jewish community, and is host of the popular podcast, For Heaven's Sake. He is the author of several books, including the highly regarded 2016 book, Putting God Second, How to Save Religion from Itself. Rabbi Hartman's newest book is Who Are the Jews and Who Can We Become? Joining Rabbi Hartman today is Moment Senior Editor Sarah Brieger. Sarah is also the director of Moment's Daniel Pearl Investigative Journalism Initiative. Sarah has won numerous awards, including first place for Religion Reporting of the Year from the Religion News Association and first place for Best In-Depth News Writing on Religion from the American Academy of Religion. Please welcome Rabbi Dr. Daniil Hartman and Sarah Brieger. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Suzanne, for putting this together. Um, Rabbi Hartman, it's a big honor to have you here. Uh, many people I admire always name you as the person they admire. So it's a privilege to be in, in conversation with you now. Thank you. Wonderful being here. Um, your new book is Who Are the Jews and Who Can We Become? Um, and it offers, I think, a really compelling framework for viewing Jewish history and a Jewish future. Um, but I was curious why you think this book is important at this moment in the Jewish story. It's important for me. Um, it's a lens. This book is, is a book that I've been thinking about for about 20 years and testing on tens of thousands of, of people over the last 15 years. And it's become a lens through which I look at the world and I look at Jewish life. And so whether it's, if these are the lenses through which I look at this war and this reality today. The book speaks about two covenants in the Jewish, that two core covenants which make up the Jewish story. That if you want to understand what Judaism is, there's two things you have to understand. One I call Genesis covenant and the other one is the Exodus covenant. The Genesis covenant is a covenant which has no Torah, no commandments. It has no obligations to believe in God, keep the Shabbat, keep the Shabbat, keep kosher. It has nothing. All it has is a story of a people who are the descendants of Abraham. According to the Genesis covenant, Abraham has to earn the relationship with God, and we inherit it by virtue of being Abraham's family. And according to Genesis, to be a Jew, Jewishness is simply who you are. It's not what you do. It's not what you believe in. There's, there's a deep core collective identity to the Jewish story. And when you look at the last 3,000 years, that 4,000, that's the way we saw ourselves. There were all types of Jews. The Bible, Jews never kept Judaism in the Bible. You know, the whole Bible could be more or less summarized as, and God spoke to Moses saying, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, do a lot of things. I have so many things I want you to do. And the Jewish people said to Moses, Moses, please tell God, no. That's more or less the whole Bible. With the exception of maybe 10 chapters, the Jewish people and God are never on the same page. We just don't do Jude. We don't do Judaism as we know it today. We just didn't. We worshiped idols. We, we, we didn't keep any of the holidays, but we were Jewish. So there's, and, and for 3,000 years there, this is a very deep sense that, that you just are Jewish. It transcends the stuff transcends you. It, it creates a core sense of loyalty. It also creates a core sense of tolerance towards other Jews because we're all around the table. You know, we're about to have a Passover Seder. You know, it's, it's, it's a challenge because how do you do a Seder with everybody who disagrees all the time? So the funny thing is we have four sons or four daughters or four children that the Haggadah speaks about. The truth is we have 473 different people sitting around the Seder, but we have a Seder because the details of Judaism don't exhaust Jewishness. And that's why one of the core laws of the Jewish tradition is an Israelite, even though they have sinned, you still are an Israelite. You're an Israelite. 
And I, in the book, I tell I tell of the very famous rabbinic ruling of a woman who, who marries an Anglican and the family insists that she converts. So she becomes an Anglican and then the marriage doesn't work out and she gets divorced. And then she comes to the high court in Jerusalem, the Haredi court, and she asks, please, I made a mistake. Can I please convert back to Judaism? And the court says, no, can't convert you back to Judaism. I reject your 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 request, your petition. And they give the reasons because you never left. You think you left. You became an Anglican. You did the whole story. But from our perspective, there's a Jewishness. And, and the rabbis even say, it's, you can no longer easy. It, it's just, it's the same. Just as you can't stop being someone's child, you can't stop being a Jew. So this is, this. you know, when you look at Jews for the last three, this is what we did. We walked together. We cared for each other. We were there for each other. We created a community in which different Jews lived. This is Genesis Judaism. And that's okay. the first... Oh. Oh, Please, can I ask one thing about where where do converts sort of fit fit into this framework? Great. Now, converts... Now, in the Bible, converts don't fit in because there is no conversion in the Bible. Um, um, but this eventually, in, in the rabbinic period, you could convert to being a Genesis Jew. Abraham, and this, the, the, you, when you convert, you are Daniel, son or daughter of Abraham. So you enter the covenant later in the same way that Jews entered it beforehand. So you could convert into being a Jew. Like the experience of many people who, who intermarry today is a process of becoming Jewish together with your spouse. It's not that you're sitting there and saying, you know, I really want to be a Jew. I like Shabbos. No, it's a, it, it, it works on a different level. And this book tries to give religious space to that level of Jewishness. So you could convert to being a Jew. And this was actually one of the core features of conversion in the rabbinic tradition. Later on, we'll come to, in a second, I'll tell you about Exodus Judaism, and that has its own conversion. Um, but you could convert. You could also, in the Bible, intermarriage was allowed. So you marry into um, a Jewish family as long as, and in the Bible, Judaism was patrilineal. It only becomes matrilineal in the second act of the second temple. So here it is. You marry into a family and you accept, just like you, you accept the family, you also accept their Jewishness. This is who you are. Um, by the way, Ruth, the famous convert, she never converted. She became Jewish by virtue of her relationship with the family. That's what she did. She There was no conversion process or rabbis back then, unless you want to claim that her mother-in-law, Naomi, was the first rabbi. So there was no, there was no process. Now, now, to come to terms with this is such a deep sense of Jewishness. That's, we feel accepted. We're part of the Jewish people. We're, in this world, there's no good Jews and there's no bad Jews. That's half the Jewish story. And any Judaism that doesn't have a Genesis covenant becomes overjudgmental and 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 divisive and sectarian. The second covenant starts in the book of Exodus, particularly in the book in Exodus 19, where God says to um, to Moses, "Tell the Israelites, you know, I know you're a bunch of Genesis Jews, and I took you out of Egypt because you're Genesis Jews. Because remember, in the Bible, they didn't do anything to earn our, our redemption. But I want to tell you, I changed my mind. I want more from you." I want you to obey my commandments. And if you do so, if you do so, you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. The key word of the Exodus covenant is the word if. It's conditional. Genesis is not conditional. You're loved by God and accepted by the Jewish people and accepted as a good Jew just by getting up in the morning. <laughs> whether you converted, whether you married in, or whether you were born, you are Jewish. That deep sense of 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 acceptance and legitimacy. But Exodus says, I want something of you. I want you to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. I want you to be something in your life, to become something. So if Genesis is the covenant of being, Exodus is the covenant of becoming. Exodus is the place where we say to you, what are you going to do? To be a Jew, we walked for three, 4,000 years, not only because of our relationship with each other, we stood for things. And if you look, this small little pishy people, the amount of value that we have given to the world, we stood for ethics, we stood for principles. What has God said to Abraham? I chose you because you will teach your children to walk in the way of God by doing what is just and right. 
Exodus is about playing that story out. And it is a life of faith. It's a life of ethics. It's a life of excellence. It's a life of spiritual, moral, and intellectual aspirations. That also defined the Jewish people. We were You were Jewish by virtue of who you are, but being Jewish meant also, you know, do something. Get up, do something. So when the student very famously said to Heschel, you know, Rabbi, I can't pray today. My spirit's not moving me. Heschel gave the classic Jewish answer. Well, my son, he said, it's time for you to move your spirit. Like Judaism is about moving yourself, challenging yourself. Now, why? And and so much. So there's, it. by the way, there's 613, come out. who cares how many? There's thousands. Judaism keeps you busy. But the Exodus covenant is not about the details. It's a principle. Pick. I don't care. Pick your one, pick your 10, pick your 50. The idea that you are commanded to be more is the essence of Exodus. Now, for, for all of our history, these two covenants speak with each other, are meant to balance each other, are create a synthesis in which both claim you. So if Genesis gets too strong, you're mediocre. Because all you are, I'm born Jewish, I'm loved. It's like the spoiled child, you know? That's the fifth child of the Seder. You know, there's the wise one, the wicked one, um, the, the one who, the simpleton and the one who doesn't know how to ask the question. The fifth one is the privileged one. <laughs> you know what I mean? Who, me? I don't have to do anything. I'm like, I don't even, I'm just, you know, I'm loved, I'm spoiled, I'm helicoptered to death, whatever it is. That's really the fifth child. I always um, heard it as the one who doesn't show up is the fifth child. <laughs> no, they show up. Well, of course they're going to show up. They just aggravate you when they show up. You know, they don't, they don't, they don't separate. They just sit, you know, they're privileged and you running around the world as if they're the only thing that's important. Um, so Genesis is very empowering. It's like a parent. I know how important it is for my kids to know that I love them unconditionally. And that empowers you. That, that, that serves as a foundation for your life. And so Genesis starts with that unconditional love. But if that's all you are, then, you know, we might as well close up shop. Like, that's it. Exodus saves Genesis from mediocrity. But Exodus creates good Jews and bad Jews, creates the potential of judgmentalism. Because if I have a way of living Jewishness, then you're not living my way, then you're not as good a Jew as me. You're not as good a Zionist as me. You're not as good a lover of Israel as me. You're not a good of whatever it might be. Genesis, if we it serves as a corrective of Exodus, because if we just had Exodus, there'd be no Jewish people. We would have divided up to our, each one of us into our own private little synagogues. Genesis says, knock yourself out. Go, aspire, but never define core Jewishness on the basis of your particular ideology. The two serve as correctives. And so you asked me, how does it, why is it important today? So first of all, it might not be important. Anybody who writes a book and thinks that their book is by definition important, I don't know, get over yourself. So I don't know if it is. It happens to be that for me, these categories were very critical because there's also a Genesis Zionism and an Exodus Zionism. Mm -hmm. Genesis Zionism says Israel is the place where the Jewish people have a right to be. I have a right to be. I have a right to be safe. I have a right to be free. I have a right to breathe and have what every other person has in the world. That's, what Gen that's part of Zionism. I want to be normal. But there's also an Exodus Zionism in which the job of an, and the task of Zionism is to create an exemplary country to create a country that stands for principles. And I frankly don't care. It's of no interest to me, whatever, what other people do. That's why I say, oh, who's the country who, I don't, I don't I'm not a Jew. I don't look to the left or to the right to decide how I could keep Shabbos and what type of ethical principles. And I don't do the same as a Zionist. So there's, Zionism is about being, an, is being about, is being great. Genesis Zionism is about being safe. Exodus Zionism is about being great. And since the beginning of this war, these two covenants have been challenging me. When my people are attacked, it activates, it violates my Genesis rights. When my people are being attacked, I stand with my people. It's unconditional. I stand with you. I'm there with you. I'm going to protect you. What is it that you need? I am there. And Genesis is, a, and October 7th was a violation of the rights that we have as Genesis Jews. But as the war progressed, and it doesn't happen right away, because when you're attacked and traumatized, it's natural that you want revenge. That's natural. 
It's natural that you want to defend yourself. It's natural that you want to keep your kids safe. All of that is natural. But Exodus, um, Zionism and Exodus Judaism says not only how do you, whether the weather doesn't just ask whether the war was just, it asks how you fight a just war justly. And what do we do? What about civilian casualties? What about humanitarian aid? What about Gazans? It asks these questions. It doesn't just sit down and say, Israel, don't worry, you were, you, I'm a Genesis Jew. I have a right to do whatever I want to do. I'm not just a Genesis Jew. I have a right to defend myself. And as a result, a just war is my right. If human life is a value, so is my life a value. But also I ask these questions and asking the two, and, and it's not a balance. It's not a, a golden mean. It's these two tensions pulling at you and balancing and aggravating you. And, and I have to tell you, from after three weeks of the war, the first three weeks, I was a Genesis Jew like everybody else. But for three weeks, I started to ask, okay, what is Exodus? But I'm, I don't want to be an Exodus Jew and die. So that's not being an Exodus Jew. It's these two responsibilities have been haunting me. And every day I wake up asking myself, what is my Genesis obligations and what are my Exodus obligations? Not in light of October 7th, in light of the particular day, and now I don't even know what we are, or April 11th, each day I ask myself these questions. And where does North American Jewry fit into this? Um, I think we're often asked to be Genesis Zionists, um, you know, in this case, but I, but, you know, I think Great. for a lot of people that's uncomfortable. I, I love the framing and um, anybody who tells you to be a Genesis Zionist, ignore them. Ignore them. They're doing exactly what my what I'm. There is no such thing as Genesis Judaism by itself. We wouldn't be here if we were just Genesis Jews. We also wouldn't be here if we were just Exodus Jews. I think there is tremendous duplicity, and it's a huge mistake when people ask North American Jews to be Genesis Ge Genesis Zionists. Because if if that's what you're going to be, you're going to be alienated Jewishly from Israel. Because you're not just Genesis Jews, you're also Exodus Jews. You have to bring your values to the conversation. So there is, it's a power play, Sarah. People want to silence you. They want you to be Genesis Jews because they don't want you to talk. But if you don't talk, not only are you alienated from Israel, you're also alienated from your Judaism. Why shouldn't you talk? Why shouldn't you have? If, you, if we want to claim, and if I do, if I claim that there is a Genesis covenant with Israel, there has to be an Exodus covenant. If you want to play in the Jewish game, you can't have one without the other. You can't say to people, I'm sorry, we are, we're are we Genesis Jews and Jews always stand for Jews and that's it. And of course you're supposed to stand for Israel. But part of the way we understand standing for Israel is talking to it, challenging it, asking questions to it. You got, You have to be. Because if, and here this is a general statement, if the only place that Exodus Judaism conversations take place is in the anti-Zionist community, then the Zionist community in North America is on a time clock and its life span is short. And by the way, it should be short because what you're basically doing is trying to destroy one of the essential characteristics of the Jewish story. And that is the balance between Exodus and, and, and Genesis. Now, once you open Exodus, you have to let people talk. Who knows what the content is going to be? But that's okay. It's I am more frightened of people lowering their expectations from Israel than having high expectations and being disappointed. Um, you, you mentioned anti-Zionism. And I'm curious... Um, you know, a lot of your book is about we as a collective, we as a people, or we as a we, basically. Are there people who are outside those boundaries or outside that tent? Um, I write about this a lot, and I've thought about this for so many years of my life. It's been one of the questions that have haunted me um, for, for many personal and ideological reasons that I won't get into right now. Um, because I am first and foremost a Genesis Jew, because I am first a Genesis Jew before I'm an Exodus Jew, boundaries have to be very, very carefully constructed. 
Because if you create a boundary, which is supposed to define the Jewish community, but in, it, but in essence excludes large members of the Jewish community, it's not a healthy boundary. You can't. Boundaries are meant to include your community. And if your boundary excludes too many, it's, it's a sociologically and ideologically problematic boundary. I'll just tell the audience you have to, it's it's a whole st I could tell you a whole I could spend an hour on that but, but I'll, I'll I've been my first book is called the boundaries of Judaism and whatever it's it's this is it's it's one of the hardest questions if you ask me I I follow the boundaries set forth by the rabbinic tradition and I won't give you all the sources for it but the rabbis basically say as follows if if the Jew if you are committed and feel bound to the Jewish people in some way or another. And if you feel bound and committed and obligated by some feature of Torah, whatever it might be, you're in the conversation. You're in the conversation. Um, so you can leave, you leave the conversation when you say the Jewish people aren't my people and Judaism is not my religion. That's a boundary. And in essence, then, it's a self-set boundary. When you exclude yourself either from the Jewish people or from Judaism, you're outside. Now, I'm not saying if you say I'm inside, if you say the Jewish people are my people, just like Ruth said, your people are my people, your God is my God, and you interpret it in different ways, you're in. So the anti-Zionist community, you can be a good Jew, part of our story, and feel that Zionism is not an essential part of what it means to be a Jew. Many people in the so-called anti-Zionist community aren't anti-Jews and they're not anti-Israelis. I might disagree with their politics. Now, I'm a Zionist, but could you have a theory which says that Israel is not the center of Jewish life? Sure you can. It's part of the conversation. I could disagree with it. Now, if you say, I don't care about Israelis, if you say October 7th, was not a tragedy. Now you're separating from the Jewish people. If you're saying the only people in the world who don't have a right to defend themselves are Jews, then you're, this is not, if it grows out of a love of the Jewish people and a love of Judaism, okay, so welcome to the disagreements of Jewish life. We have, it's not started, what, this is the heresy that we can't imagine that someone says, I don't like the, I don't want to express my Jewishness through a relationship with Israel. Fair enough. But if the Jews of Israel if their lives don't claim you, if you don't feel bad. You know, Maimonides has this category where he says, um, what is to, one of the boundaries is to separate yourself from the community. And he says, if you're not happy when the Jewish people are happy and you don't mourn when the Jewish people are mourning, and he says, but you walk as if you were one of the Goye Haaretz, one of the non-Jews of the land. He says, then, then you're outside of the story. That's it. So if, if there's going to be a serious debate about the place of Israel for contemporary Jewish life, okay, well, I welcome it. Why not? There's no issue that's outside of conversation. But the one issue is if Jewish blood being spilt doesn't keep you up at night, and if some aspect of living a Jewish life doesn't claim you, then you're doing it. Then you really are part of another religion, because our religion is these two covenants. If you are part of those, if you shake, embrace them, but interpret them differently, you know, even if you aggravate me, I grow from the people who aggravate me. I grow from them. What do you think? I want a bunch of people just saying, "Oh, you're wonderful." That creates. That's the greatest creation of mediocrity. We can't be frightened of when you are when you silence conversation. What you're claiming is that your identity is morally and intellectually bankrupt. Let's bring it on. We live in an open marketplace of ideas. Bring it on. Challenge me. Zionism, for it to live and, and, and survive in America, it has to answer those questions, not silence those questions. I'm what? sorry, but this is a, I care a lot about this issue. <laughs> um, well, a lot of what you've been describing is, is self-exclusion. And I'm curious if there is a kind of group exclusion or some people have used there, the word uh, undo someone, you know. That's, Can, I don't use those terms. Yeah. Um, I don't use those terms. They're not terms that I feel comfortable with. Um, for me, it's, as I said, 
I exclude those who self-exclude. If you feel claimed by the Jewish people, even if you disagree with me or I disagree with you about what that means, you're part of my story. You're part of my people. Just like if somebody has a different idea of what Torah, what Shabbos means, what Kashrus means, what intermarriage is about. Like, since when are the Jewish people the people who are frightened of ideas? Once you're inside and you see yourself as inside, I have to live with you. You're part of my conversation. You're part of my community. And I am, ob I as a gen, I'm obligated to you. I'm obligated to teach you, but most importantly, I'm obligated to make sure that you have a place around the table. And a lot of the boundaries that are being created are boundaries of weakness, not boundaries of ideology. Or, or fear. Um, fear. But, yeah, but uh, to push this a little bit, um, you know, at the moment we have this section called Ask the Rabbis, where we ask, you know, nine different denominations. Every year it seems to be another denomination. The same question. <laughs> Um, and then they, you know, they all answer, but I've gotten, you know, I've gotten two emails that I think about sometime. One from a Karite who said, can you include a Karite leader in this? And one from a Messianic Jew who said, why aren't you asking Messianic rabbis to, to weigh in? Right. Um, and it made me think about, you know, who gets to decide who, the, who these boundaries, what these boundaries are. So for, you're absolutely right. So first of all, you get to decide. We all decide in our own little spaces, right? So good for you. But there's a difference between you deciding. Like I could decide who I invite into the Hartman Institute, but I never think that who I divide is, is who I invite decide defines who are the Jewish people. So let's be real. Number one, Karaites. I've had Karite students. There's actually a vibrant Karite community in Israel, but they're so small, it becomes a theoretic. Like, who really cares? Like, you know, they care. And you know what? If you're a Karite Jew, come on in. You know, if you if this is your thing, well, that's what's going to aggravate me. Like, really? I, you know, the the the, the Karites are, are, are one of the least of our problems. Jews for Jesus is a slightly bigger issue. But even there, by the way, statistically, most Jews for Jesus are non-Jews. Jews for Jesus, the vast majority of Jews for Jesus are non-Jews. And it's just a, it's a, it's a, it's a language with which to proselytize and to bring Jews to become followers of Jesus. Doesn't mean everybody. There's a, it's a small little community. It's mostly Jews for Jesus because Jesus was a Jew. Um, but in reality, when you embrace Christianity as your religion, do you remember I said, does Torah claim you? The fact is Torah doesn't claim you anymore. Christianity claims you. You know, the New Testament claims you. I don't have a New Testament. I have a Jewish Bible and I have a Christian Bible, and I respect the Christian Bible. And I think Christianity is authentic religion. I believe Christians and Muslims were chosen by God just like Jews were, but it's just not Judaism. I have no, you're not a bad person. God still loves you. I think God answers Christian prayers and Muslim prayers, all of the above. You're just not a Jew. So Jews for Jesus is actually an easy boundary. Because it's not a conceptual question. It's not about, oh, is belief in Jesus as the Messiah a, a, a boundary-breaking issue? You talk, it's not such a big issue. If you love Israel, love the Jewish people, keep Torah, and you just think that Jesus, good for you. The problem is, is that it's a sociological statement, not an ideological one. And the boundaries of Judaism are precisely sociological. You're really not inside. So, you know, for the 15 people who are in, I have no problem. Like, they're too, they don't bother me. You know, it's like, okay. But, like, um, it's it, the vast majority of the movement is not an inside movement. It's an external movement. Um, a lot of um, the discussion in your book is about a shared story. And I was curious how you felt about denominations, if they're necessary evil or you think they're good. I think they're great. Mm-hmm. And still, I still believe that one of the best statements about denominations ever put forth was that by Yitz Greenberg, who said, I don't care what denomination you belong to as long as you're embarrassed by it. I just thought that that was just, it was subtle, it was beautiful, it was profound, it had everything in it, and call a couple to Yitz for that. Um, the, like, I, denominations, I think they're great, because it's like, I am an Orthodox secular Jew. Those are my denominations. Um, that's where I belong. That's my mindset. I, I observe a large part of Jewish halacha law as an Orthodox Jew, but I have a secular mindset in which um, the primary authority in my life is my mind and my moral conscience. 
And my life is about bridging those two together. My Exodus covenant is a combination of secular ethics and Jewish law as they talk to each other. And I believe that this is a tradition that goes back for thousands of years. And some people think I'm crazy. Some people don't. Again, I'm not running for politics, so it doesn't bother me. You know what I mean? Um, uh, um, it's, it's a, this is a core sense. Now, these categories are helpful for me. I love my Judaism, but I found a place which I, like I created a home within which I could breathe. So denominations are great because they create options for people to breathe. How many people, if I, you know, I know hundreds, millions of Jews, if all Judaism was reform or vice versa, all, all it was conservative or orthodox, or so, you couldn't breathe. So denominations are templates. They're like, you know, you open up your, you want to write a Word document, there's a template. But the only thing is, if you just have one denomination, it's probably not helping you. <laughs> like, because now you're a prisoner to a category instead of using the denominations as a vehicle to express yourself. Like, I have a, I'm an Orthodox Jew committed to egalitarianism, committed to the rights and and the dignity of people regardless of their genders. And, and I'm committed to, to the equality of all of humankind, committed to changing halakha whenever it violates my moral principles. So many people say, okay, you're not an Orthodox. I, I, I don't care what people are going to say. Or I'm an Orthodox Jew because halakha obligates me because Shabbos starts at 6.04. Not, Shabbos doesn't start when I get ready. Shabbos starts at a moment that demands of me to get ready. I love halakha. I love the dignity and structure. I love what it demands of me. I'm an Orthodox Jew, sometimes. I'm also a secular Jew, sometimes. Now, the fact that I have an ability to live with both is, what, is, is how I build my home. So denominations are, are phenomenal templates to provide us with ways of living as a Jew. But everybody who belongs to a denomination should not only live by Yitz's definition that you should be embarrassed by it because that means you can be critical of it. But more than that, you also have to remember that the Jewish people are bigger than your denomination. That the, the denomination is just a subcategory because at the end, I am claimed by my people. They, they claim me. They, they obligate me. I have a responsibility to them. And I don't care if you're Orthodox, Conservative, Reform, Reconstruction, Reconstruction, Post-Denominational, Secular, and that's six. You have nine. I'm love them. You know, great. Whatever it might be. I don't care. You claim me regardless of which shul you go to or don't go to. So I denominations give me a tool to build a home that I could breathe in, but the Jewish people will always be bigger. Um, I am first. Denominations are a byproduct of the Exodus Covenant. And first and foremost, I am first a Genesis Jew. I think, I mean, denominations also often lead to people saying, you know, who's in, who's out. Um, That's right. As, as you That's were talking. They, yeah. Right. I was thinking about um, where Haredi Jews fit fit into all of this. Haredi Jews are just, I like my siblings who aggravate me. Mm -hmm. They're still my, they aggravate me. I don't, you know, I don't like their Judaism. I don't. I really don't. I don't feel close to their Judaism. I don't appreciate. I don't, but it's not. But it's not. But as a Genesis Jew, they part of my people, and that means they have a place in Israel and they have a place in my life, and I have to respect them. And the challenge is, what happens when certain Jews think that they're the only good Jews? That like so they aggravate me. Welcome. So Jews have been aggravating each other for three, four thousand years. That's part of the story. Of course, we aggravate each other. We aggravate God. We aggravate each other. The problem is, is some Jews think that they're the that they have a monopoly on authentic Judaism. So, but by the way, that's okay. My problem is, is that too many Jews have an inferiority complex to thinking that they have a monopoly. They don't. They're just like every other denomination. So, they're not. They're not so tolerant. Well, the obligations of tolerance apply also to those who are intolerant. They're, especially as a Genesis Jew. They're part of my story. Everybody's part of my story. I don't walk away from anybody. I also don't let anybody push anybody else out of the room. Um, you know, Passover is coming up, and you mentioned this um, about, um, you know, arguments that are going to take place um, during the Seder. I'm getting all these emails from different organizations of how to 
you know, guide yourself during these, you know, horrible satyrs that you're going to have that are going to be heartrending and all of that. But, you know, is, is there a way for us to kind of come together? Is there something we can look to for us to come together and kind of move forward? Of course there is, but we have to decide if we want to. And mm -hmm. I don't know if we want to. We like aggravating each other. So, you know, like there was once this family therapist who said, you know, Shabbos and Pesach are, on the one hand, he spends all of his life that this, this our tradition focuses on, on the family. And more people have problems with their family on Shabbos and Pesach than any, like we, you know, family's great in theory. It's family in practice that actually is a challenge. And uh, listen, at the Seder, I just remember you're a Genesis Jew. So when somebody comes and wants to aggravate you, smile. Now that might aggravate them more because maybe what that because they think you're ignoring them. Okay, just remember the Seder's one night. You in America, some of you have two nights. That's your punishment for not living in Israel. But it's a uh, so you go. So you know what? So somebody aggravated you. Okay, it's their Genesis requires a deep sense of humility to understand that you don't own the Jewish story, and we let's talk. So I do believe that families there has to be a culture of debate. There has to be a culture of disagreement. But that's very hard in families. You know, very often when you come to the Seder, you're still fighting about something that happened 40 years ago that you don't even remember, but the other person does. And, and there's no way. That's, so you know what? It's part, of the, it's part of the beauty of the Pesach. It's also, as long as, don't get up from the table. Mm -hmm. Don't get up from the table. There's nothing that someone should say that should cause you to get up from the table. And at the same time, don't let anything that somebody says call them a bad Jew. Don't, that's why, and actually the four sons is a bad example because the evil child should have never been dealt with the way that the evil child was dealt with. First of all, he's not evil in the first place. It was just a silly thing. It's just a paradigm. So you know what? The kid asks, what is this worship to you? Is that the hardest question we're going to face? That's what our kids are asking us. What does Israel mean to you? What does Judaism mean to you? So what are you going to say to them? Oh, to you and not to him? Oh, if you were in Egypt, you wouldn't have been. No, these are my people. So try and, uh, and remember if I could just share one really, really valuable lesson of the rabbis, as Jews, we're supposed to criticize each other. And anytime you see a Jew doing something wrong, you're supposed to tell them. But the rabbis say, just as it is a mitzvah to say that which will be heard, so is it a mitzvah not to say that which will not be heard. Answer and notice if someone doesn't, it's okay. It's okay. Don't leave the table, my friends. Uh, you, you mentioned Jewish stories and... I was curious about, you know, what what are the Jewish stories we should be telling ourselves? Um, sometimes I'm sometimes I think the stories today that we're telling ourselves are more reactive. You know, we're telling a story of anti-Semitism. We're telling a story of, you know, negation of identity in a way. Um, but what are the stories we should be telling ourselves? Again, I think the story, and this is what my book is about, is that I want everybody to tell a Genesis and Exodus story, but they have to tell their own. Genesis and Exodus. Our shared story is not that we tell the exact same plot. There's a general theme. There's a theme of, of, of our relationship with God by virtue of who we are. And there's our relationship with God by virtue of what we are obligated to become. Ask yourself those questions. And how do you answer that question will, will make Judaism interesting for you. If you don't have, it's, we have to become storytellers because you can't inherit a story. Our job, this is really the paradox of Pesach, our job is to pass down the story to the Jewish people. But it's their job to tell it in a new way. They don't, you tell the story, but don't think that the other person has to retell it the way you want to. We all have to become storytellers. And by the way, that's when Pesach becomes, Seder becomes interesting. When you're just reading the Haggadah, because that's the story that somebody told, it's a dead, boring book. It really is a pretty mediocre book. You have to pick the interesting parts. You have to use a lot of the creative new Haggadot that are out there. And there's so many of them. And, uh, you know, a plug for the Tzion Haggadah, my colleague and friends, Michelle and Noam Tzion. Like, these are tools that help me. But it's, what is it about? It's about you telling your story. Don't, you know, remember, it's not a sitter that you're supposed to daven. You know, it's just telling a story means it's okay not to read every word. It's not about telling someone else. It's about asking great questions. What does Jewish people mean? 
What does Israel mean? What are what are, what are you struggling with after October seventh? What are your struggles with Jewishness? Talk about what is it. What's your favorite mitzvah? All of the above are what's going to make that story meaningful. And at the end, the beauty of a story is that there's really no one right way to tell a story. Like who's who? who what's the major part of the story? What's the minor? Who are the heroes? Who are the heroines? Who are the villains? What's what is the what is the message? It all it's one big Rashomon. That's what's so beautiful about a story. And a people actually, we don't need a code of behavior. We need stories, but we need people who are going to tell stories. Is is there anything um that looking back on your book, you know, it was published in October, um, or in the fall, um, would you have changed um since you know, since the war in these past six months? Um, the biggest thing that I would have changed, I think about that a lot. So first of all, absolutely. Um, there were things would have changed. Tones would have changed. Examples would have changed. The principle of Genesis and Exodus, which I believe has survived 4,000 years, is going to survive October 7th. Like that, that core story remains. Um, but one of the things that I, I really don't talk about at all in my book is anti-Semitism. I don't talk about it. Um, because I really don't like anti-Semitism. I don't like it, not because it makes us uncomfortable. I don't like it because it makes Judaism mediocre. And here, that is one of the core teachings of my father of blessed memory. In his, uh, he wrote this phenomenal article, I was raised on it, mm -hmm. called Auschwitz or Sinai. And it's not about denying, and it's not about, see, as Genesis Jews, I, I, I have to defend myself against anti-Semitism. But I don't think that the hatred of others is what's going to make my life inspiring. I don't know anybody who's going to keep Jewish, who's going to remain Jewish today because anti-Semitism is increasing. Today, today Jews could leave quicker than any other point in Jewish history. And so many of us, our family, are married to non-Jews why should the non-Jewish spouse stay in? And there's exit. It's easy. It's not, you, you don't have to leave your, you, you leave your people. You don't have to leave your family. The only thing that's going to keep us Jewish is A, if we protect ourselves from our dangers. But at the same time, if we have something meaningful to say, and anti-Semitism is something we have to protect ourselves from, it doesn't give meaning to being Jewish. And so I, but, but, a very large percentage of North American Jews feel that something has changed, that it's not the same. And uh, I, would, I would have to give more of an accounting to that. I would have to write another chapter in the book um, that's missing. But that's okay. Books are, um, books are supposed to advance thought. They're not supposed to give, all, to give answers to, uh, uh, to life's questions. <laughs> There's always a second printing and a third printing if you want to yeah. add something you, have to take, you take yourself too seriously. It's, it's not what it's about. <laughs> let someone else, you know, you write another book, let someone else. It's, you're, it's A book is part of a chain of 3,000 years of thinking. And, yet, you know, you're blessed if you could be part of that chain. And if some Jews could come and say, you know, your book helped me think about something. So it's okay. Um, I'm going to turn to questions in a minute, but I wanted to end um, asking if there's any Torah or any kind of Jewish teaching that you've turned to over the past six months that may have provided some sort of comfort. Oh, I'm not in a comfort mood right now. And um, I'm actually trying to make Jews uncomfortable. Um so I, I don't know. It's a great question. I think about it a lot. You know, one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible is a verse that haunts me. It doesn't, doesn't give me comfort. It just haunts me. And it's Leviticus 19 when God says, God spoke to Moses saying, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Leviticus 19, verse 1 and 2. Now, on the, on the surface, in a monotheistic tradition, this verse is insane because monotheism is not just about the oneness of God, it's about the uniqueness of God. So if God's holy, 
I don't have to be holy. Like, I don't, like he got. Like, if there's one thing that if that that as a Jew I don't have to be. If God's holy, I'm done. Okay, I have to keep Shabbos. I have to keep kosher. I have to do ABC. I have holidays. All the above. You came up with a religion with 286 holidays. Phenomenal. You got me. But if God's holy, I'm done. But our tradition says you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. We had the chutzpah to say to people, there is one God. God is holy. God is just, God is righteous, and you have to emulate God. That's what I want for myself. That's what I want for my people, and that's what I want from Israel. And it's tough, because to be a Genesis Jew and to aspire for holiness, it's hard. And um, my bracha to everybody is just try. Nobody knows how to do it. No one has it down pat. Nobody owns moral righteousness and nobody owns love of Jews. Just let, let it go. Just, you know, when God said, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, I'm holy, we know that nobody's ever going to be holy. <laughs> You're never going to be there. It's just a journey. So I don't know if this, it doesn't give me comfort, but it gives my life meaning. Like, we got to work. We have to. We have, to, we have to survive in an evil and difficult world. But we have to stand for what we Jews stand for. You shall be holy. Is, um, it's pushing me. It's pushing me. And maybe remembering that, you know, every, other people are also created in the image of God, too, and are holy, too. And how do we kind of put, you know, remember that as we go through our lives? That's that's again, one of the essential parts of what you shall be holy in is, um, is remembering your moral principles. And, and our religious tradition is a religious tradition which doesn't start with God's covenant with the Jewish people. God's first covenant in the world, I spoke about Genesis Judaism and Exodus Judaism, but there's, um, th there's the Genesis covenant, which is not a covenant of Judaism. It's a covenant between God and human beings, quite human beings, in which all human beings are created in the image of God. Our, my Genesis covenant starts in Exodus in Genesis 12. My Torah starts in Genesis 1. So a big part of you shall be holy is how do I love the Jewish people and and maintain my commitments to all people being created in the image of God. That's that's what I that was the short for you shall be holy. So thank you for making that clear. No, thank you. Um I'm going to turn to questions. If people have some, they should just Put them into the chat. Um, one person asked, what is your response or adaptive response to the fact that 70% of Jews intermarry? What's my response? Yeah. Welcome to the Jewish people. <laughs> no, it's a great question. I don't mean to belittle it because the answer has changed. Because for 2000, in the Bible, intermarriage was, was allowed as long as you joined a Jewish family. In other words, as long as your spouse was going to join the family and your spouse was going to embrace your religious tradition, it was allowed. Intermarriage becomes forbidden after the destruction of the Second Temple. Um, it's possibly also forbidden. It is forbidden also in the period of Ezra in, uh, in, at, at, at the end, you know, 510, 4, 490, no one knows exactly when, somewhere around there. There is an explicit statement prohibiting intermarriage in the book of Ezra chapter 9. But for the first 1,500 years or so of Jewish history, intermarriage was allowed. Then intermarriage becomes forbidden because intermarriage is perceived as exiting both the Genesis and Exodus covenant. Anybody who intermarried, the non-Jew who was marrying a Jew wasn't embracing Judaism and the Jewish people. Let's be clear. You know, we speak about the three great monotheistic faiths. They have a billion and a half and a billion and a half, and we have 14 million. So it's like, it's really funny. But the fact that we were the first gives us some status. But in the period, in the Roman period, in, the, in, the, in, in early Christianity, Islam, Middle Ages, if a Jew married a non-Jew, they were leaving. And the last thing that the non-Jew would think of would be that they're Jew, joining the Jewish people. I joke about it, but it's true. Like, why would somebody in an anti-Semitic world want to be Jewish? What, they want to check out a pogrom? They want to see if they could outrun a Kozak? Like, it would be insane. So intermarriage involved the rejection of Exodus and Genesis. The fact is, is that as intermarriage returns, 
to Jewish life in the 60s and then grows 70s, 80s to 70%, what's happening is that Jews who are intermarrying are no longer leaving either Genesis or Exodus. They're not. Not only are they not leaving, Jews are the most beloved religion in America. People who are marrying Jews are open to living Jewish lives, whether they convert or not. So what's my response to intermarriage? Welcome to the Jewish people. It's, these are Jews. We're Jews. Um, they're not outside. You know, in theory, do I, I would love every Jew to get a great Jewish education. I'd love them to go to Jewish camp, day schools. I'd love them to go, to go to Jewish camps. I'd love them to live in families where both spouses are committed to Judaism and living Jewish lives. I'd like them to visit Israel. I'd like them to be reading Hebrew and knowledgeable. I have a whole list of, you know, knock yourself out. That people has never existed. So we today are an intermarried people. But the minute we're an intermarried people, it's no longer a boundary. It's just not a boundary. Welcome to the Jewish people. That's who we are. And now the serious question we face is what do we, how do we respond to non-Jewish spouses? How do we create a community that's welcoming? How do we make sure that the children have a Jewish life that they could love? It's true. You know, it's a little harder. It is. But two Jewishly born parents who hate Judaism aren't going to bring up Jews. So it's true. Two Jewish parents who love Judaism and give the whole package, it is, it would be easier. Okay, so it's not so easy. It just means we have to work harder. That's all. Um, if, if I'm remembering correctly, I think um, in the last Pew survey, there was a section for people who aren't Jewish, but who feel connected to the Jewish people because their grandchildren are Jewish or their step-siblings are Jewish or, you know, they've, you know, been in a Jewish household for a lot of their lives. Yeah. But somehow, like, they have but they've put their lot in with the Jewish people in some way. Absolutely. Now, the Pew survey, every like here, like from you to the rest, a big part of Pew uses Protestant categories of religion. They only understand religion in Exodus terms, but Judaism understands religion in Genesis terms too. And so a lot of people are embraced, are bec like I know literally thousands of Jews who have intermarried, and the thing that's most attractive to them is that they could become, is that they're part, they're joining a people. They're accepted. Um, it's a loving community. And then uh, some of our rituals are, are meaningful. And so we, our challenge with, with, with it, see, there really isn't intermarriage anymore. See, intermarriage assumes that somebody is a Jew who's marrying a Christian, let's say, or one for religion. Today, we have multiple identities. We're Jewish and American and our gender and our we have like and our political identities. You know, the real intermarriage that exists today is between liberals and conservatives. You know, that's the Pew says that, by the way, there is no that that's intermarriage. That's the hardest marriage. That's the hardest one. And they don't marry, by the way. And if they do, they end up in divorce. Mm -hmm. So someone who is Jewish and American and let's say liberal, just for example, and someone who is Christian and American and liberal will marry each other. And so they share two out of their three identities. They're not really intermarrying, but then it creates opportunities for the merging. Intermarriage challenges our identity because Jews don't have to stay, but it also creates an opportunity. Just We all just have to remember, that's who the Jews are. So there are Jews who are born Jewish, and today there are Jews who weren't born Jewish, and they never converted. The question is, do you embrace Genesis and do you embrace Exodus? If you do, you're part of my people, and let's talk. Uh, related to this discussion about categories, somebody asks, what do you think of Svartim who don't have denominations? Ah, that's a, a great question. Um, Svartim don't have denominations, but they have a denomination called Misorati Judaism. They just don't call it a denomination, but uh, they don't have the distinction between Orthodox and German Reform, etc. but they do have a take. They do have a denomination. Now, a colleague of mine, uh, Yoshua Drory, um, gave he's who's who's a, who's a Misora, he's a Sephardi Jew with a very, a very um, um, strong sense of his Jewishness through Sephardic tradition. He says one of the big differences between Ashkenazim and Sephardim, and by the way, this is a simplification because everything is, but it has it has some insight. He said in in much of Ashkenazi Judaism, we ask what you don't keep. Oh, you're not, you're not keeping Shabbos? You're not keeping kosher? You're not going to the shul that I want? It's like, it's the denomination, the lines are by what you don't do. He said in Sephardic denomination, the question is, what do you do? Not what you don't do. 
So you have a Shabbos meal? Great, you keep Shabbos. No one's asking what you're doing later. No one's asking where you're driving and which game you're going to. Or be. It's just not, it's about adding. It's not about where we're subtracting. Now, that's a denomination. That's a take. There's a take of, of Judaism which comes from that. Now, that's a powerful idea. So I believe one of the great gifts of Israel today is that Misorati Judaism has become one of the denominations of Judaism. It's not just, you know, one of my colleagues did this analysis, and I think he's correct. The vast majority of Jews today in Israel are Masorati Jews. And we learned that from the Sephardic community. So it's a denomination. It's, it's again, I don't care about denominations. I care. I, I want to live a meaningful life. And anybody who has a take, I want to learn from it. Svardi, Masorati Jews have a take. They also don't exclude people. They have a take. I have, we all have what to learn from them. Actually, in, in the Ask the Rabbis column, um, one of the Sephardi rabbis asked to be called modern Sephardi instead of, he said, I'm not Sephardi, I'm modern Sephardi. And I, so I thought, oh, a new denomination is occurring. Yeah, they have that. You know, in, the, in, the, in the Bureau of Statistics of Israel, they call, there's, there's Misorati Dati, Misorati Lodati. There's Misorati, religious Misorati and non-religious Misorati, which is the same classic binary of Israel. But this is much better. I am modern Sephardi. I'm traditional Sephardi. There's so many options. Listen, that's what makes Judaism beautiful. We all, we, 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 we you know, at the end, of it, we're trying to, you know, we're trying to get through the day and we're trying to live a meaningful life. And um, in each one of these categories, there are categories that give our life meaning. But if we can't play with them, they they choke us. So this is, you know, God bless him and God or her, and God bless anybody who plays these. You know, live a life, be part of the story. I don't care what you do. Um, just don't let anybody else tell you if you're a good player or not, and don't choose on your own not to play because you don't have an answer. Tell the story, struggle, and then join this three thousand, four thousand year old people and tradition who, when we look back in history, it's a powerful story. We've done a lot of good, a lot of good, and it's an honor and a privilege to be part of that. Um, I'll ask what, one last question from here. It's about um, being optimistic about the Jewish future. Are, are, are you optimistic about the Jewish future? Um, um, that's, I, 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 I find pessimism a luxury we can't afford. I can't be pessimistic. I can't embrace any story in which the Jewish people don't don't aren't alive and aren't strong. I can't embrace any story in which the Jewish people lose. I can't. So it's uh, I just don't. I, you know, I speak about it on my podcast all the time, and every time I just don't do pessimism. I don't find it constructive. Um, you know, life is what it is. I'm not naive. Um, I don't think optimism is a naivete. I think optimism is a choice. But a lot of my optimism just grows out of my responsibility. Where is pessimism going to lead you? Like what? What are you going to do with it? At the end, we have to. Our our obligation is to get up, and to change. Forget changing the world. That's too big for me. I don't know how to change the world. Change your neighborhood. Change your family. Change your street. Change your country. I have too much work to do, to be pessimistic. Now, uh, and the one thing that I have great great faith in is I am a member of a people who for 4,000 years have defied every odd. We were never the wisest. We were never the smart smartest. We were never the wealthiest. We were never the most numerous. We stood for something. And that people who stood for something have proven that when you have values and you stand for principles, you could withstand any empire and you ultimately defeat evil. I have I I have faith in the Jewish people, and I know today is a dark day, and these last months are dark, but they're not the darkest days. You know, people talk about October 7th, but on October 8th, the Jewish people came alive. We came alive. It's true. We lost the war of October 7th. October 8th, the Jewish people are alive. Now, how we go forward and what we do, that again, like all stories, it's in, it's in our hands. So yes, I am optimistic because that's my responsibility. And optimistic because Jewish history makes that a, a, 
good bet. Thank you. Um, thank you for taking the time to speak with us um, and for the chizuk going forward. Um, thank you for everyone else who's here. Um, and just a reminder to sign up for next week's Zoominar. Um, thank you. Thank you, Sarah.